Good morning and good afternoon to everyone who is joining us. I see our, our attendees are, are starting to join, including some, some friends of SDSN, some colleagues. So we're gonna get started in just a minute or two as we uh, wait for our attendees to, to start to join. All right, we'll take it just one more minute. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us for the launch of the 2020 Africa SDG Index and Dashboards Report. My name is Eve Delamoth Karubi. I am a senior manager at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. That's UNSDSN, uh, which are the co-authors of this report, along with the uh, SDG Center for Africa. Um, and just to give you a quick overview of our webinar agenda. We're going to start with a short video presenting some of the highlights of this year's report. I'll then give a little bit more of a detailed presentation about the content of the report and some of the key findings. And then we will have a panel discussion to discuss the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the SDGs and this principle of leaving no one behind in Africa. I am, um, we are all actually very privileged today um, to have a truly extraordinary panel of um, experienced women leaders from across the continent. We have Maurice Atoke from Nigeria, we have Judith Kaulem from Zimbabwe, and Dr. Miriam Were from Kenya, who will be joining us for a discussion. And then, of course, we will leave some time for question and answers at the end uh, of the uh, hour and a half we have together today. Um, I'm going to ask my co-host, Cheyenne, to launch um, a video, um, which will give some of the highlights of the report, just to get started. Thanks very much, Cheyenne. All right, I see we have some attendees who might have uh, raised hands. We're gonna save questions for, um, for the end. Um, but if you do have uh, questions that come up either during the presentation or the discussion, feel free to pop those in the chat um, and we'll be keeping an eye on the chat and use those, dis those questions as the basis also for our um, Q&A session. So I'm going to go back to 
sharing my screen. All right, so as I said, we are presenting first the, um, the report and its findings. So for those of you who might not be as familiar um, with the SDSN, um, just a quick word. We are um, an independent uh, organization operating under the auspices of the UN Secretary General since 2012. Um, at the beginning, our mandate was to support the crafting and creation of what became the SDGs. And in 2015, our mandate was renewed to support their implementation. We are uh, led and directed by Professor Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University. And our mission is to mobilize scientific and technical expertise from mainly academia and other knowledge institutions like civil society and the private sector, really focusing on problem solving for sustainable development. Our priorities are articulated um, around three main areas of work. The first is policy analysis. Uh, this report falls under that category. We also have an online university called the SDG Academy, which offers upwards of 30 completely free, uh, massive open online courses on all topics of sustainable development. And finally, we also um, are developing a global network of knowledge institutions. To date, we have about 1,300 member universities and research institutes around the world organized at the national and regional level to work together to localize the goals uh, and identify solutions uh, and advise their governments at the national and regional level on pathways to achieve the goals. Getting to um, the report itself, uh, you should know that we also publish a global SDG index and dash boards report, uh, which is called the Sustainable Development Report. We've been publishing this report annually since 2016. And the Africa report we've been publishing since 2018. So this is our third annual report that we developed in partnership with the SDG Center for Africa. This year's report uh, has an overarching theme of leave no one behind. Um, and we added a chapter on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, we've updated our survey on government implementation efforts. And the report also includes four case studies on leave no one behind. This year, these case studies were all um, written by partner organizations such as the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. Um, and finally, just a word on the purpose of this report. This report is really um, a, a high level snapshot of the situation of the SDGs in Africa. It can help to identify priorities and understand challenges, um, track progress and help parties to ensure accountability and also identify gaps to achieve the SDGs by 2030. We are using um, internationally comparable data because we're, we're also comparing countries between themselves um, to allow us to track progress and see how countries at the same sort of socioeconomic level are faring across these different um, indicators and goals. So a quick snapshot of the analysis that we're presenting in this year's report. As I said, the theme of this report is leaving no one behind. And we've identified eight factors which um, are really key and uh, ultimately hindering the ability of African countries to fulfill this promise to leave no one behind. Um, I'm just gonna give a very quick overview of those eight factors. One of them um, is what we call a demographic imbalance um, due to really uh, rapid population growth and high fertility rates. Another is governance, in particular, ineffective governments or unaccountable and unresponsive institutions. Another factor is data gaps, which is essentially weak statistical systems, uh, which are really hindering the ability to track uh, whether marginalized groups are progressing 
sufficiently um, and on track with the rest of the country. Inequalities and discrimination, um, whether these are embedded uh, in laws or policies um, or uh, societal norms um, that cause exclusion and bias, uh, these really hinder uh, the ability for all, po all population within a country to achieve the goals. Um, over on the right side, you'll see we have um, shocks and fragility. Um, and so, of course, uh, we're, we're experiencing a, a major shock, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but we also have to keep in mind um, extreme weather events uh, like cyclone, um, cyclones and, um, and other extreme weather events that particularly can have a negative effect on vulnerable groups. What we call socioeconomic status um, has to do with really reaching those who are furthest behind. Um, and this also touches on this, this question of inequality and discrimination within households. Uh, on geographical location, this has to do primarily with um, the urban rural divide. Uh, and we really do see um, an uneven pace of progress between urban and rural populations. Um, the, and the fact is, is that rural populations are more disadvantaged. And uh, finally, we've identified this question of limited resources. So the limited ability uh, to mobilize domestic resources, um, the uh, unfulfilled promises of the Addis Ababa action agenda on financing for development, um, and really the, the global sort of economic contraction and the fact that many donor countries are continuing not to fulfill their promises um, to support developing countries in achieving the goals. As I said, we've done a little bit uh, more of an analysis on this question of the COVID-19 pandemic um, through the lens of leaving no one behind. And in fact, you know, while there are some immediate impacts, uh, very obvious ones, for example, on goal three, on health and well-being, um, in fact, we found that there are uh, effects on every single one of the 17 SDGs. So for example, on uh, goal one on poverty, um, we've seen estimates that up to 23, 23 million more people could be pushed into extreme poverty due to the pandemic. Um, on goal two, zero hunger, up to 73 million Africans are forecast to be food insecure due to the pandemic. Um, it's not all negative. Um, on um, the environmental goals, goal 13, climate action. Uh, we did during the, the main period of lockdown in the first part of the year, saw a significant decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, on goal 14, we also saw reduced fishing and on goal 15, um, overall reduced pressures on the environment. Um, however, um, these conclusions were also at the time of writing uh, earlier in the year, and it seems that as our pace of life uh, ticks back up, um, unfortunately, these small gains that were made are, are quickly um, being uh, erased. Another part of the report I mentioned is what we call our Government Implementation Efforts uh, Survey. So we do analyze the implementation policies of all 54 African countries. And our review is then sent to all country governments and experts to validate our responses. This year, we got 34 responses from countries. Um, and our findings are that African countries have really done good work on endorsing the SDGs on, and on developing national strategies. In fact, only three countries seem to not have very clear national strategies to implement the goals. And in addition, almost all countries have identified um, 
a coordinating unit within government that is responsible for overseeing the implementation. On the negative side, unfortunately, um, there hasn't been sufficient consideration for the financial needs and the funding sources. So almost all of our um, uh, different country contacts and country experts um, said that there was really a lack of financial needs, but at the same time, there hasn't been really um, uh, careful costing and budgetary assessments of actually how much uh, is needed to achieve each goal in each country. Uh, on the whole of government engagement, we also found that um, parliaments um, and legislative engagement generally is quite low. Very few countries have um, had debates in parliament on the SDGs or have um, standing committees um, where the SDGs are regularly addressed. Um, in terms of progress, compared to the uh, survey we did in previous years, stakeholder engagement has improved, um, but it does remain insufficient and more is needed. Uh, and as I said, lack of resources has really been flagged as a challenge and also lack of data has been really flagged as a, as a big challenge that countries face. Just to give a little bit more detail on, on a couple of these points, on awareness raising here, what you see on this graph, the lighter colored blue is the survey result from 2019 and the darker blue is the survey result from 2020. On awareness raising, you'll see that almost half of half the countries are doing um, some type of awareness raising. The most common form of that is like a public awareness campaign and that can take lots of different forms. Um, and interestingly, we see this year um, a really a jump on partnerships with media um, to raise awareness uh, about the goals. That's almost a, a 10 percentage point uh, difference year on year. And on stakeholder engagement, overall um, meetings with interest groups uh, is the, um, the main mechanism for engagement. And we've also seen quite a um, quite a lot of progress on that, um, as well as on the use of focus groups and expert panels. On the main implementation challenges, the lack of adequate uh, dedicated financial resources um, really emerged as the number one uh, challenge that people identified, um, followed rather closely by the lack of adequate data. So this includes um, the, the coverage of the data, the quality of the data, and even the availability of the indicators. As I'm sure many of you know, we have um, over 240 official indicators and very few countries, even developed countries, um, are, are lacking um, on this. What we saw also really as a significant rise was um, this commentary about the lack of capacity in government to actually implement the goals, which was um, an interesting and troubling change to see um, compared to the survey that we conducted last year. Uh, I'm now going to move uh, to a discussion about actually the results um, and our findings on the index and dashboards. Before I get into the drum roll and reveal our top ranked country this year, just a couple of words about the methodology and the data that we use to reach these conclusions. This is a methodology that has been developed over the past couple of years, uh, and it has been audited by the European Commission's Joint Research Center. This is um, recognized as the global experts essentially on uh, this type of composite index. Uh, and they advised us and really validated the, the methodology that we have retained. Um, we use a total of 97 indicators in the report. 67 of those indicators are retained from the global report. And we use an additional 30 indicators which are really specific to the Africa context. And these include some indicators which were informed by the African Union's 2063 agenda. 
Um, of course, since we are trying to compare countries and track progress, we need to make sure that the data we're using are available for the majority of countries. So um, among, other among other criteria, coverage is a very important one. And this means that we don't only use official data sources. Um, we do also use some non-official data sources. These can be um, academic institutions and others. Um, for example, we use a corruption indicator by Transparency International. So these are um, indicators that are collected annually and rigorously calculated um, and have strong methodologies behind them as well to inform us um, and, uh, and, and serve essentially as proxy indicators since we don't have official indicators on some of these uh, topics. A couple of words also about the limitations of our analysis. Uh, unfortunately, due to insufficient data, Equatorial Guinea and the Seychelles are not included in this year's index ranking. Uh, and overall, um, we do have 6.5% of missing values, though this is lower than uh, the missing values that we had in 2019. So we are seeing an improvement in the coverage. And unfortunately, on some of the data as well, we do have um, some old data points um, from household surveys that may have been conducted, for example, under the MDGs. Um, and so that's unfortunate. What we have included in the country profiles is the year for every single data point. So we're very transparent um, on, uh, on the timeliness of this data. So, Drum roll, please. I reveal to you our top 10 ranking for the Africa Index. We do rank 52 um, countries. On this map, the darker colored countries are the ones with the higher scores. So our score is from zero, which is the worst, to 100, which is the best. And essentially, you can interpret this score as a percentage of SDG achievement. So Tunisia uh, is our top ranking country with a score of 67.1. And so essentially that lets us say that Tunisia is about three quarters of the way to achieving the goals. Um, it's important to note that um, within the top um, three rankings here, we have less than one point of difference. And so these, these differences are really not majorly significant. These are really small differences between, um, between these top countries. But essentially, our, our conclusions are similar to the previous years, is that North Africa overall is performing very well, um, as well as a couple of the small island states. Uh, a quick word also, we, we do have a, a trends analysis um, across, um, for, for every single indicator for which we have time series data available. In this case, that's 59 out of the 97 indicators. Unfortunately, we don't have trends available for goals 10 or 12, but I just wanted to familiarize you with this four arrow key that we use. So the green arrow is essentially the countries on track or maintaining SDG achievement. Um, and it goes down to this red decreasing arrow, meaning that the country is moving completely in the wrong direction. Um, and we apply uh, the same color scheme, the same traffic light score to our dashboard. Um, so you'll see here our Africa dashboard. Unfortunately, for 13 out of 17 of the goals, not a single African country has actually achieved a green dashboard. Um, according to our analysis of the dashboard, the goals that are facing the greatest challenges are SDG 3 on good health and well-being, SDG 9 on infrastructure, and SDG 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions. On the trends, there's a little bit more nuance. Interestingly, on SDG 3, which in terms of the dashboard status, the current status right now, um, the majority of countries, 76% of countries, are actually moderately improving on health. Um, this same improvement is also being registered on SDG 8 on decent work. 
It should be said though that the data that we're using also predates the pandemic. So some of these trends that we've identified um, might be and will likely be affected by the pandemic. This year, for the first time in the Africa report, we have also introduced um, a new Leave No One Behind index and dashboard. So this links to the overarching theme of the report. Um, we're all familiar with this principle of Leave No One Behind. Uh, this commonly denotes inequalities within each country. And this could be inequalities in income and wealth, um, inequalities in access, whether it's access to services or to infrastructure, um, and we also include gender inequalities. All of the indicators that we use for this new index are also part of the overall Africa index. We've just selected a subset of indicators according to um, a few different categories. And the idea is that this index brings out some of these inequalities that are hidden by the average value in the overall index. And we can see that essentially in terms of the ranking, if you look at the image here, the, the leave no one behind ranking is the first column and the second column is the index ranking. So you can see that essentially the top five countries are more or less the same, though not precisely in the same order. Um, there are a few notable exceptions though. Some countries are scoring much higher. Um, and essentially what this tells us um, is that even though their current overall status is challenging, they do have less inequalities within their population. And on the flip side, there are some countries which, you know, perform somewhat well on the overall ranking, but score a lot lower on the leave no one behind index. And our interpretation of that is that they, these countries maybe have a better score overall um, due to good performance on some environmental goals. But when it comes to social issues and social inequalities, these are, are real challenges. Uh, we do present an overall leave no one behind dashboard, but um, here I'm going to present the regional version of that dashboard. But just to say that overall, the stark conclusion is that all African countries are really struggling to leave no one behind. In fact, there are no green ranking, there, there are no green um, uh, scores anywhere on, on any of these, um, on any of these uh, leave no one behind categories. On the regional dashboard, we're also seeing pretty poor um, current performance. The only one that has moderate challenges is income inequality in North Africa. Um, and uh, unfortunately, East and West Africa are, are tied with the worst um, performance. They have three red categories, so on extreme poverty, on gender inequality, and on access to and um, quality of services. In terms of the trends, uh, unfortunately, again, no region is on track for any of these categories. And the dominant trend that we're seeing is really stagnation. Um, once again, North Africa is the region that's performing best um, as they uh, are having moderate improvements across all of the categories. And I'm going to wrap up this presentation of the report just to share with you um, one of the country profiles from the report itself so you get a sense of um, what, what kind of uh, information you'll have access to uh, when you read the report. So this is part of our Tunisia country profile. You'll remember that Tunisia is um, the top ranking country this year. So in our country profile, we present the index score as well as the leave no one behind score, um, the, the ranking. And we have this, um, this sort of spider web graph that presents the performance by SDG. 
And then we also have the dashboards that are presented in the country profiles. So here the top dashboard is the current assessment. So that's where the country stands with regards to each goal. So here we see that um, the major challenges that Tunisia is facing are in gender inequality, on gender equality, on goal seven, on affordable and clean energy, and on goal eight, on decent work and economic growth. And on the uh, dashboard below, which presents the trends, um, it's sort of interesting to see on those three goals that are facing the most challenges. In fact, we do see moderate improvements on goals seven and eight, um, and the trends are um, more troubling across some other goals as well. So I invite you all to visit our website, sdgindex.org. You can download the report and you can also explore our interactive data portal. Um, we have a map there. It allows you to click on different countries and see the performance. Um, we'll also have available a summary version of the report, which is about 10 pages. And that summary report is also available in French for our Francophone um, colleagues. I'm going to wrap up there on the presentation of the 2020 report. Thank you all for your kind attention. Um, again, please have a look at our website and feel free to reach out to me directly for any questions. We're now going to move to the uh, discussion portion of this afternoon's launch. And I'm really honored and privileged to welcome our three panelists today. Um, the first is Maurice Atoki, who this year was named as the CEO of the African Business Coalition for Health, known as ABC Health. Her background is in global financial and auditing services. She worked at Ernst & Young and then at PricewaterhouseCoopers Nigeria, covering the SDGs, sustainability, and climate change. She is an alumna of both the Harvard Business School and the London School of Business and, and Finance. So welcome, Maurice. We also have Judith Kaulem, who is the executive director uh, for the Poverty Reduction Forum Trust in Zimbabwe. She has extensive expertise in the area of poverty, gender, and human development research. She's a graduate of the University of Zimbabwe and sits on many international boards, including Partners for Review and the Tech Network, as well as many local NGOs. And last but not least, uh, we have the doyen of our uh, panel today, Professor Miriam Were from Kenya. She is a medical doctor, a public health advocate, and an educator. She is currently serving on the Lancet's COVID-19 Commission. This is an interdisciplinary initiative across health, business, finance, and public policy, which is aimed to help speed up global, equitable, and lasting solutions to the pandemic. She is also the former chancellor of Moy University in Kenya, former chairwoman of Kenya's National AIDS Control Council, and the board of AMREF, which is the Africa Medical and Research Foundation. She's also the recipient of many awards over her illustrious career. Please um, join me in welcoming this wonderful panel. So I'll invite the panelists to please um, turn on their cameras. We have Maurice and Professor Wary and Judith. And I, I just wanna say it's such an honor to have such wonderful, strong, intelligent women from three different regions of the continent here. We have West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa represented. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, I want to open up and start the discussion. Um, I, I would be really interested just to hear very briefly from each of you about um, the current situation in your country with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, if whether you're locked down or not, freedom of movement, that kind of thing. Um, and then my second question, after a, a quick answer on that one, will be to discuss a little bit more um, the impact of the pandemic on, on the SDGs. So um, maybe we can start with you, Judith. Um, just a, a couple of sentences on what the situation is on in Zimbabwe. Uh, thank you very much, Eve, and thank you for having me on this platform. Um, for Zimbabwe, with regards to COVID-19, we actually had our first case in March. Um, 
And to date, uh, with regards to COVID-19, um, we have 7,837 confirmed cases. We have uh, 6,122 recoveries, and the country has experienced uh, 238 deaths uh, over the period. We started with a lockdown, a total lockdown uh, at level four uh, in, um, in May. We are now moved down to level two. So the economy is beginning to open up and people are beginning to either work from home or work from their offices. But it's like things are going back to normal slowly. Yeah. Thank you for that perspective, Judith. It sounds like Zimbabwe was um, somehow spared the worst of it. Um, Maury, is over to you. Yeah. yeah. Maury, is over to, over to you for a, a, an update from Nigeria. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, if, uh, if, uh, and thanks, um, Judith, for that perspective on, on Zimbabwe. So Nigeria, as you know, we, we, we are 200 million. So don't get scared when you hear the numbers. Um, we, we, we have a, today we have a total confirmed cases of about 58,644 persons. Um, active cases, uh, 7,549,937 and about 1,111 deaths in total. Um, we had a total lockdown in March at about level four, but today we're at um, about level two with most people returning to work, but a bit um, still staggered by um, using the mask, uh, uh, keeping the rules and ensuring that uh, people are kept safe. Over. Thanks for that update from Nigeria. Professor Ware, can you share a, a quick update on the situation in Kenya to give us a sense of um, how the pandemic has run its course there? Thank you very much, you. Kenya has had uh, an up and down relationship with COVID. The first lockdown was in March, and uh, it actually lasted until sometime in July when all the schools were closed and uh, we were not allowed to travel and, and, and so on. The daily numbers of uh, the infected and the dead have also been going up and down. Then we went through a period in August where we felt that things were going down, but unfortunately they have also started going up again. So right now, the country time has been reduced in the sense that we can now stay out until 11, but there is still curfew. Uh, there have still the restrictions on school. Our schools are still closed. And we are hoping that the tertiary institutions will begin opening in October, beginning the 5th of October. But the primary schools and the high schools are still uncertain. So we are still in the woods, but we are, uh, we have a very organized, the government has a very organized approach to this under the Ministry of Health, and we believe that uh, we are moving forward. Thank you so much for, for that perspective, Professor Wary. And um, you, you, you snuck ahead a little bit in, in answering because when you touch on this question of school closures, um, this is, uh, has a huge impact, of course, on SDG achievement when we look at SDG 4 um, and also on SDG 10, where really inequalities are ex deeply exacerbated by school closures, where um, families that have the luxury of home computers and good internet access um, and families that are educated themselves can also maintain a level of educational achievement for their children but those families that are already poor, already disadvantaged, already marginalized, are, are facing now this additional burden of having the children completely out of school. Um, and so uh, maybe not only focusing on SDG 4, um, but I'd be interested in, in going around the group again to share your perspective on the different ways that the pandemic is negatively affecting the SDG implementation in your country. And so maybe if we can go back to Professor Wary and I'll, I'll go in, in reverse order this time. Uh, 
the, the performance of SDGs in, in our country, and generally in Eastern Africa, I think that we are really in a bit of a struggle. We are really struggling. SDG 1, as you know, the poverty issues, is not very well performed all over Africa. The SDG 2, the food security issue, is still a, a, quite a challenge. Uh, coming from the health sector, I wish I could say that SDG 3 is much better, but unfortunately it is not. Um, SDG 4 is dicey. So I guess we are, uh, Eastern Africa has not done very well. You, you look at Uganda, Tanzania, even Rwanda. Rwanda, I say even Rwanda because I had hoped that the, the standing of Rwanda would be much better because they seem to be quite organized. But uh, our, the index doesn't show very much uh, different between the different countries. And of course, South Sudan is our, our very, very desperate country, which needs a lot of help. So in general, I say that uh, we are happy that we are doing a little better on the climate action issue, which is linked to uh, the use of the environment uh, and so on. So what I, what I would like to see is a follow-up of some kind on linking the climate action to increased food production and increased health. And then, because you have to start somewhere, and uh, maybe go to say where we can start with the climate action area plus the health area, and then uh, the school you can't really postpone it because the children are there. And I was I was in the village for four months of lockdown, and the children were everywhere on the streets, on the roads, and uh, looking very desperate. So I was not surprised that we had such a high level of teenage pregnancies and so on. So we just decided in the, as a family to establish a tuition for the high school group. And that's more than a hundred children and teachers are there. But it is a desperate situation. It is a desperate situation. Thank you very much, Professor Ware. And it's interesting that you mentioned SDG 13 also because this is basically the only goal um, where the continent as a whole is performing well. Um, and you know, you can argue also that it's a little bit symptomatic of underdevelopment, um, that you don't have as much of the industrialization and pollution as in other countries. Um, and I, you know, there's hope also that um, African countries can sort of leapfrog and, and bypass um, the same development path that other countries have followed, which have led to, um, you know, a, a lot of environmental degradation and, and excessive uh, pollution. Um, so thank you for, for making that link as well. Um, Maurice, over to you on, uh, on how you see this pandemic um, negatively affecting SDG implementation. It would be interesting as well because I, I know um, in, in other interactions that you've had that you have been working uh, with the Nigerian government. I, I'd also be interested to hear if you see um, the SDGs being pushed aside as a priority during the pandemic, or if the SDGs are still helping to orient some uh, long-term policy planning. Right. Thank you so much um, for that. Uh, so, I mean, Nigeria's case, uh, well, I wouldn't know whether um, quite a number of other countries have the same uh, circumstances, but coincidentally, uh, year 2020, particularly January, was the commencement of the decade of action for the SDGs in Nigeria. Uh, however, COVID came around and across the country, um, there's been challenging um, circumstances as far as the prospects of achieving the SDGs are concerned generally. Um, from the health hazards uh, to human consequences of COVID-19, the socioeconomic uncertainties, disruptions at a substantial cost to the entire economy, and so on and so forth. But particularly, um, there's been a lot of work done around uh, the priority goals that have been impacted the most, negatively impacted the most, um, as far as the goals, uh, as far as COVID-19 is concerned. And I will talk to goal one, uh, as, goal one uh, as well as goal three, as you know, um, on health and well-being. Uh, goal four and five, 
education as well as gender equality, and of course, goal 16 and 17. Um, on goal one and eight, uh, it's, it's, it's Nigeria still trying to recover from the recession um, and now faced with uh, a, a global pandemic, um, the emergence of COVID-19 and its spread across the world has actually forced a decline in oil prices by 55%. Um, but however, in Nigeria, the National Assembly called for drastic review and changes in the earlier revenue expectations and fiscal projections uh, for Nigeria. We have a projection to have a combined effect of a 0.55% drop in GDP in Nigeria uh, because of COVID-19. I mean, that's, that's a bit uh, deep or, or from our end. Uh, and that's about goal one. For goal three, which is uh, <laughs> health and well-being, the major one is um, the toll that it took on the health facilities generally. Uh, of course, the infrastructure across the country, um, you can imagine uh, that even health workers um, suffered a lot um, as COVID-19 cases were resulting to functioning below capacity or shutting down completely of these um, um, health centers and the fear of the monumental break, uh, keeping people at home with a lot of uncertainty. Um, it's also caused a lot of disruption in the routine of health services uh, from maternal uh, uh, um, health issues to child and reproductive health services, as well as nutrition, and, and so on and so forth. That's a bit about uh, uh, goal three. If we look at goal four, um, we examine it from the very fact that um, schools could not be opened, um, and generally the spread of COVID-19 led to an increased number of children, youth and adults, uh, to stop education, to stop attending schools, and school calendars were largely disrupted. But more importantly in this part of the world is the fact that these people that stop going to school, majority we suspect will not um, go back to school. So it took a lot to convince um, some of this uh, base of the pyramid households to get their children into the school system. Uh, and now that they've had to sit at home for a number of months, um, it's going to take much more effort, you know, to convince them to get back into, into the school as schools begin to resume. In terms of goal five, um, it, it's, it's um, largely also aligned with the global uh, menace of uh, uh, a lot of issues with women, um, both mental and um, just generally undermining the efforts of women in the society. Relatedly, women are the largest um, caterers for the needs uh, for beneficiaries um, of something called the NSIP in Nigeria. And that NSIP has about four components. And this is a deliberate effort because um, of the size of how COVID-19 has negatively affected uh, women in Nigeria. So we have the National Social Investment Program um, made up of conditional cash transfers, homegrown school feeding, um, uh, and something called Empower. Empower it's, it's a, a vocational um, capa capability building uh, for women in Nigeria. And um, before the last one is the goal 16, which is to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. Um, in Nigeria, as we know, already peace has been largely disrupted. Um, especially in the northern region. Uh, so when we add things like the pandemic to the peace and security that has been largely um, negatively affected, we're talking about huge um, pandemics and security issues here. Uh, evidently, health pandemics um, have the capacity by themselves alone to increase the risk of domestic violence. Um, violence extended to even health workers that are uh, attempting to save the situation um, is largely um, a situation to deal with uh, in the northern part of Nigeria, you know, uh, apart from COVID-19 itself. And lastly, um, is goal 17, is to strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize global partnership for sustainable development. 
for Nigeria, the total government revenues as a proportion of GDP uh, witnessed a marginal increase from 2015 to 2018. But now with COVID-19 outbreak, um, it's induced economic contraction, including the drastic decline in the price of crude oil. The capacity of Nigeria to generate the 2020 projected revenue is really quite undermined. Um, it's really looking very, very, uh, I mean, safe to say, hopeless, uh, but we do know that there's been quite a number of efforts uh, by the federal and state government, as well as development partners and organized private sector to step up their efforts um, to increase funding generally uh, targeted at COVID-19 itself, uh, majorly for the health sector and by extension uh, for the achievement of the goals. Over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maurice. And I appreciate the sort of goal by goal analysis. And um, uh, of course, as you said, you know, Nigeria is uh, being very hard hit, not only by a health crisis, but by an economic um, crisis because of this, uh, because of this drop in the, in the oil price. Um, so yeah, uh, coupled with, of course, as you mentioned, the ongoing uh, instability. Um, Judith. Over to you, um, with your perspective and expertise on gender and poverty um, and, and the work of your NGO, I'd be interested particularly if you could tackle a little bit the leave no one behind um, angle um, of, uh, of how the pandemic is affecting STG implementation in Zimbabwe. Judith, I'm afraid you're, you're still on mute. Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Eve. I think I will just, I will limit myself uh, to maybe goal um, three, four, and eight as I, as I sh share about the situation in Zimbabwe and probably pick from where colleagues have already spoken about education and say in Zimbabwe, schools, are, schools and universities are were closed down on the 24th of March. Um, and before the COVID pandemic, um, there were at least 1 million, 1.2 million children between the ages of three and 12 years who needed emergency and uh, specialized services in education. These children included um, orphan and vulnerable children, children with disabilities, children living with HIV and AIDS, and children who needed a school feeding. So with the closure of the schools, the, the impact really was adverse on more than 4.6 million students across from, from ECD to primary, secondary, and, and higher institutions. And as a response, um, government then introduced e-learning. It also introduced radio programs to try and keep students um, engaged in education. But unfortunately, this is at the backdrop of a country that only has 41% of the population with access to electricity. And of that percentage, 16%, only 16% are found in the rural areas and 70% in the urban areas. And more than 80% of the rural population actually rely on wood fuel for, 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 the, for their day-to-day -day, um, subsistence in that regard. So the benefits, we, we, we then begin to see high inequalities happening, not only between rural and urban population, but also within urban populations themselves. Because with the introduction of the e-learning, you find that um, no, the, the electricity supply in Zimbabwe is generally erratic. So even those in the urban areas could not, are not always connected for them to have the e-learning. And also um, the data costs are really huge because this is coming at a time where if you are looking at even goal eight, where the country is highly, highly informalized, the unemployment rate was already high before, before COVID-19, 
Um, so you find that the benefits of even introducing e-learning were only enjoyed by a few of the students who would have afforded it. Government, yes, during the course of the period is negotiated with service providers for a reasonable packages of data. But even that still is only focusing on those who already have access, access to uh, electricity, access to internet. And those in the rural areas are completely left out. We have also seen that um, students who have impairments like hearing, uh, vision impairments, they cannot benefit from the platforms that have been put up for example, some schools have been innovative where they don't have internet, they've created WhatsApp groups, but where you have students who have impairments, hearing, uh, visual impairments, they cannot access the, 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 those, those platforms and the e-learning platforms. Um, and so you find that within the education, and like Maurice said, this is a generation where if we are talking about sustainability, this is a generation which, if it's crippled now, the, the long-term impacts are really immense. Because for children to catch up, uh, to only yesterday, the government uh, opened for students who are going to sit for their Cambridge examinations and who are going to sit for local examinations. So those have been asked now to go back and sit the examinations. But the question on everybody's mind, including parents, who saw their children day in, day out, not doing anything productive academic-wise, is what is it that they are going to rip out of the, of, of the, of the examinations. So the, the opening up and allowing students to write almost becomes a box-ticking exercise. But we are all anxious to see what, what will come out of it. And um, like I also indicated, Zimbabwe, before COVID, the, the official unemployment rate is at 11%, but we know that the reality is the unemployment rate is over 80%. And the economy is highly informalized, where you have over 90% of businesses in Zimbabwe being in the informal sector. So the lockdown, not only did it disrupt the informal activities, but in most cases, it's actually shut shop for most of the people who are in the informal sector. So that's over 70% of the population who are being left behind in the economic development of the country. And now with the new normal, uh, where everything has gone digital, the people in the informal sector, most of them, by the time COVID came, very few of them had the skills and the capacity to operate online. And so now, so now digital marketing is becoming a challenge. So even when the country is loosening the lockdown measures and trying to open up the economy, most of them cannot get back to where they were. And even if they open, they don't have the skills and capacity to then operate in the new normal of digital um, operation. And the informal economy is then what uh, holds most of the population. So you find that parents who have these children who are supposed to be doing e-learning do not have disposable income because their businesses have really been disrupted. So you see that vicious cycle um, happening all over again. And maybe if I can just briefly speak about um, health, uh, looking at, um, at goal three. From what I said with regards to the statistics of Zimbabwe and COVID-19, relatively, we, 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 are, we are not at a bad state. I mean, every life matters. We are sorry for the lives that were lost, but our statistics compared to other countries are manageable. But so really the challenges that we see in the health sector, in my view, are not necessarily as a result of COVID-19. These are challenges that we have had for a long time. What COVID-19 has only done is to put a spotlight on those challenges, 
on, on the neglect that has been put on not investing in efficient health systems. We already had challenges of accessibility, of affordability of health services. We already had challenges of um, persistent uh, strikes by health personnel. We already had challenges of um, our health facilities not having enough drugs. So those challenges were already there. What COVID-19 has done is to exacerbate that situation. And, and maybe the other thing that I might highlight is in responding to COVID-19, um, the, the government took a very health-oriented kind of approach and probably not looking at the larger picture. So you find that government has invested a lot in terms of building for the first time in all districts, isolation and treatment centers. These are in districts where you don't have hospitals that are functional, but resources have been channeled towards building this infrastructure, which in my view might not necessarily be optimally used given our levels of um, uh, COVID um, infections. So in so doing, you find that, for example, women are disproportionately affected because maternal health services are not up to standards and they cannot then access them because resources are being put to specifically respond to COVID-related kind of emergencies. So in that regard, you see that the, the gap in terms of um, accessibility, affordability of resources continues to be wide and wide. The marginalized groups, the traditionally marginalized groups, women, children, people with disability are really in a difficult situation during this period. Yeah. Thank you so much, Judith. And um, I think you, you stated it really well is that a lot of the challenges that we're seeing right now are not new. It's just exacerbating existing issues, whether it's a weakness in a health system or a weakness in an educational system. It's the pandemic is really putting the spotlight on, on all of these challenges. Um, so yeah, with, with the time we have left, because I'd like to leave a few minutes for discussion, um, I want to give you all the opportunity. I, I don't want to artificially um, try to brighten the mood because everything has been very somber and it's, um, it's, a, it's obviously a very difficult situation, but I would be interested in hearing about the work that you're doing um, in your organizations to address some of these issues that we've talked about. So this is an opportunity to talk about some, some new initiatives, some solutions, and also a chance to promote some of the great work that you're doing. Um, so I'd like to give you each just, just two minutes, so we're mindful of the time, so we have some opportunity for discussion. Um, and so I'd like to go back to you first, Professor Ware, um, to say a few words um, about the, the Lancet Commission and some of the work there, and maybe some other things that you're working on um, in Kenya, and then we'll, we'll just circle back around. Uh, you're still on mute, Professor Ware. I'm not on mute. Uh, thank you very much. In the Lancet Commission, we have been looking at the impact of COVID-19. And uh, as you might guess, we have found, of course, that it has a lot of impacts, negative impacts on the physical well-being of countries, on social well-being, particularly the health status. We have the school system and, 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 and so many other things. So the point of been taking is how do we get more people informed about what is actually happening? So the Lancet Commission wrote a report which was presented by our chairman, Professor Sachs, to the UN uh, General Assembly in, in this last day during this month, and uh, it was well received. So what we, are, what we are trying to do is to reach out to other organizations such as the G20 and the heads of UN agencies so that we can find ways of, of approaching this way. Well, for instance, the IMF uh, is the organization that 
has the opportunity to respond to financial crises. So one of the things we're discussing is how do we work, how does the commission work with IMF or members of the commission work with the IMF to be able to respond, maybe not by country by country, but in a group of countries. So it is, it is a, a hope giving situation while um, while it is a very difficult situation. The Kenyan situation is really, uh, I don't think it's very different from the others because it is just uh, right now the problem is money. The, the problem is uh, it was not a planned event and we're already struggling. And unfortunately, we do have the problem of corruption so that uh, some of the funds disappear along, along the way somehow. So we are trying to work on all those things, but uh, it's a difficult situation, but we can't run away from it. I'm very happy to see that my two colleagues are young women, young people. So I have hope that the younger generation in Africa seems very determined to find solutions. And that's giving me a lot of hope and a lot of joy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ware. And for those who are interested in the chat, I included the link to the Commission's uh, first statement. Um, and so over then to uh, Maurice to say a few words about ABC Health and um, some of the solutions and things that are being worked on in Nigeria and beyond, because this is a, a continental uh, coalition. Thank you so much. Um, I think a good place to start is uh, the efforts that we witnessed in Nigeria uh, with the private sector coming together um, as soon as this uh, COVID was you know, identified as a pandemic. Um, it was uh, so, um, uh, I mean, safe to say well done that uh, together as a private sector, businesses came together and they were able to put together funding um, that was necessary for the immediate response um, to COVID in a country as large as Nigeria. And altogether, they were able to put to, pull together about 75 million USD. I mean, Nigeria, that's some substantial amount of money coming from, you know, um, corporate businesses. Um, to talk particularly to what we do in Africa Business Coalition for Health um, is to galvanize businesses. Um, in a structured way to get them to um, scale on health outcomes in individual countries across Africa. Um, in other words, we are the, we want to call ourselves the go-to person um, who has, you know, fashioned out um, the time, the resources to put a more structured approach to um, health development, um, um, support to government um, from the private sector for African countries. And so what the founding partners uh, who happens to be um, a co-chair of the Global Business Coalition for Health, Aigu um, Jemukwiti and Aliko Dangote Foundation, um, um, through Aliko Dangote himself, uh, what they came together to do is to kind of mirror um, the success of the Global Business Coalition for Health and apply um, those models, those um, opportunities, um, those approaches to African countries to combat health and improve health outcomes. And that's what we're all about. Um, we're just, we're, we're really quite new now. We're only launched in 2019, in February 2019, on the margins of the um, African Union uh, Business Summit in Addis um, in February 2019. Um, but we're in the middle of, you know, putting together our strategy now and at some point, we want to go to um, respective African countries to deploy private sector health alliances to um, get them more focused, um, to get them more channeled, more charged um, around improving health um, outcomes um, in Africa as a region. So we're partnering with governments, with regional institutions, with international agencies. Um, we're taking all, you know, all the resources we're ad adopting a more structured and result-oriented and scalable um, uh, in terms of impact approach to it. Uh, we're hopeful that if it's more organized, if it's more, if it's deliberately structured, uh, there's a tendency that more will be done than have individual corporates uh, doing you know, things 
by themselves. And yeah, that's what we're about in ABC Health. Thank you so much, Maurice. It's, um, it, it's great to have the perspective also of, of the private sector. So, so thank you for that. And uh, Judith, with the, the closing words about um, some of the things that uh, you're working on at the Poverty Reduction Forum Trust and, uh, and some positive developments, hopefully. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. If actually what we noticed, what we noticed with the advent of COVID nineteen was um, everybody and most of government were overwhelmed in trying to respond directly to COVID nineteen to the extent that we felt SDGs were being put in the back burner. So we have made a, a deliberate effort to ensure that they remain um, on the table. And to do this, we, we because we are an organization that does. Um, Police advocacy, informed by, by research, which is participated. So we, we do a lot of uh, engagements with, uh, with the different stakeholders. So we have really uh, deliberately put, make, made sure that we have a series of um, programs on the online platforms using radio, uh, using webinars to engage, to constantly make sure that the issues of SDGs are, are, are not left out. We have had a series of radio programs bringing together even government itself. We have um, engaged government because at the start of the lockdown, government puts in place a social protection safety net where they are giving the vulnerable groups that they targeted. Initially, they were giving them 150 um, Zimbabwe dollars, which that time was my, like $1.50. And now it has been increased to 300 That's about $3. So we have been making noise with the minister to ensure that in what informs the safety net is um, the framework that the government is coming from. And in this particular case, we are saying the SDGs, because government committed, government also prioritized 10 SDGs, they need to be informed by those indicators that we need to be tracking and ensure that the people's dignity is maintained throughout. So th that's the kind of um, engagement that we, we have been having. So we continuously galvanize civil society voice so we can track um, whatever interventions government is putting in place, even in the name of COVID-19, to what extent they respond uh, to, the, to the targets that government uh, is, is committed to. So um, we are not necessarily on the ground uh, doing things because we are into research. So our work is limited really to just engaging and giving voice and urgency to, to government's uh, interventions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith, for, for the great work that you're doing. And that's really also at the heart of what SDSN is trying to do is um, use research to inform better policymaking towards the SDGs. And of course, your organization is also a member of the SDSN. Um, and, and we thank you for that. In fact, all of you in one way or another have been connected to our work. Um, so thank you for your different contributions. And thank you so much for um, joining this launch and this uh, discussion panel today. Um, I don't actually see any um, questions in the chat. Oh, I just see one chest question actually for you, Judith, from uh, Tinel de la Cruz. The question is, I see there is an SDG trend of, quote, on track maintaining a green arrow. Can you explain positives or highlights which equate to this positive trend in Zimbabwe? Um, I, I'm actually surprised that we have a green on SDG eight. Um, I'm, I'm surprised as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up the country profile so we can. <laughs> yes, the same exactly. Thing. And and I, one, I don't know um, the the respondents to the survey when you send it out. So um, probably because we are in a new dispensation that came into being in 2018. And part of the mantra of that new dispensation was Zimbabwe is open for business. So they've been riding on that one, opening up to investors coming into Zimbabwe. But we haven't seen results that, um, that have trickled down, that have trickled down to the ordinary persons in Zimbabwe. 
like I said earlier on in my in, in, in my presentation, that Zimbabwe's um, unemployment rate from the anecdotal information is over 80%. So unless you are using the official data, which is 11%. So really, um, I, I'm surprised by the green, especially in uh, SDG 8. It's, uh, for me, it's far from being green. Thank you. So, so what we see here is that the current status is orange, which is um, you know, one of the, the poorer scores, but that the projections from here to 2030 is that actually Zimbabwe would be on track. And if we go over and look, this, this gives me a chance um, for you all to see um, how our, our indicators are presented. It looks like there's a positive trend on the employment to population ratio um, a positive trend on adults with a bank account um, and also on the starting a business score. So um, that, that goes to what you were saying about the quote unquote open for business um, policy. So um, yeah, again, the, the trends are, are projections that are based on, um, on performance um, over the past few years. And uh, the, the data that we're using in the report this year um, of course, is data that predates the pandemic. And so I think, unfortunately, a lot of the positive projections may not pan out because of the challenges um, that we've been discussing. Maybe um, just to add, if maybe just to add to say, because I think Zimbabwe is, I don't know if there are any other countries on the African continent, which is popular with having university graduates who are doing menial jobs on the, on, the, on the streets because our industries, are, if, if most of them have closed down and um, unless our education system changes to, 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 to breeding entrepreneurs, not job seekers, we might just continue to have a very high unemployment and productive rate. Yes, yeah, thank you for that point. We have another question about the impact of population growth on SDG implementation and how this is contributing to some other challenges. Um, I wonder, Maurice, coming from the most populous country in Africa, if you can say a couple of words about the challenge of really high population growth. Right. Um, yes. <laughs> coming from Nigeria, the most populous country, in Africa and also residing in Lagos State, um, the most populous you know, city. Uh, so it's actually really been challenging um, from the perspective of particularly of the commercial city of Lagos State um, uh, in terms of achieving the goals. There's been a lot of um, strain on the infrastructure as they put them in place um, um, from a Lagos point of view. But largely, uh, I think for, for Nigeria, um, my own position will be that I think it's pretty early uh, to still um, to kind of give um, a precise prediction about how um, COVID-19 has actually really impacted negatively on achieving the goals. I think another three to six months would be a better time because um, I think the, the COVID was such a, um, was such a surprise um, to the entire to the entirety of the plans and you know the um, all, all and every other thing that um, it will be unfair um, as we're budding and you know just getting out of the COVID uh, by God's grace we will finally get out of it and um, and to see how much people can actually uh, come back to the table and kind of um, uh, intensify the efforts and you know fast forward most of these things that um, uh, all the times that have been wasted and try to put things um, in, in a better perspective. So generally in terms of population, I, I mean, I have the facts and data of before COVID, um, I think it was a big strain on the entire um, um, infrastructure system. Uh, um, Nigeria increasing in population uh, still staggers uh, the achievement of the goals, even though there are efforts you know, here and there. Um, but again, even migration into uh, commercial, small commercial um, cities like Lagos, like Port Harcourt, um, gets worrying, you know, um, all the time because we can tell that the population uh, in those 
respective places, um, the infrastructures in place are, and, and the plans, you know, for, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not aligned in any way. It doesn't look like, I mean, uh, we're ever going to live in the air and there's just a lot of people, you know, um, in small places, both at uh, the base of the pyramid and other um, levels of livelihood. Uh, so generally, I will say it's, it's a big strain on the entire um, development and infrastructure um, 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 levels of, of, of a place like Nigeria in terms of jobs and um, uh, uh, employment, in terms of um, empowerment, in terms of women, um, uh, uh, women um, vocational uh, uh, training for women and so on and so forth. Um, it's a struggle. The governments are struggling um, and hopefully we, we, we're looking forward to a brighter uh, Nigeria. Thank you so much for that perspective. Um, and with the couple minutes we have left, we have one last question. Uh, I'm gonna ask you, Professor Ware, if you can help me answer it. Um, this is from uh, Professor Labode Popola, who's the Vice Chancellor of Osun State University in Nigeria. Uh, he's the chair of SDSN Nigeria. Um, and his question uh, to wrap up our discussion today is, in spite of the pandemic, um, how do you rate the overall performance of the continent on the SDGs? Do you feel like the continent is doing well, that there's positive um, impetus towards these goals? Oh, you're still on mute, Professor. Yes, it's quite, what, what, I didn't follow the last part of your question. What is that? I think the, the question is, um, if you, aside from the pandemic, um, if you, how do you consider the overall performance of African countries on the SDGs? Is your sense that there's a, a positive direction or stagnation or worse that, um, that the goals are, are off track? Well, the overall performance of the SDGs is not very encouraging. As, 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 as was given in the report, uh, out of the 17 uh, SDGs, only more than 13 didn't have a green indication that they were moving forward. So there, were, there was the evidence is that we are struggling. And the second evidence is that not everybody is struggling equally because there, we are not moving together. A lot of people are being left behind. So really, we really need to call the drawing board again. And uh, I am very grateful that uh, the student, uh, the SDSN is working with Africa on these issues, even through the SDNS chapters that is developing in the African continent or in national continent. Because um, in national context, because we really need to go back to the drawing board. Now, the unfortunate part is that the pandemic has made things worse because not only has it made health worse, but it has made the economic situation worse. It has made the, the trading situation worse. It has made tra transportation of resources to Africa in terms of supplies more difficult. But we have to survive. And that is the, the bottom line is that we have to survive. So I think that uh, I can say my son, who is the vice chancellor of our university, we need to go, particularly the academics, need to go back to the drawing board and say, how do we get out of this? It is not going to be an easy challenge, but we must survive. And so we shall survive, but we need to have really serious thinking. If you look at this report, which is the 2020 report that we are launching today, there are a lot of challenges. And I think we need to face the fact that we have challenges. We were not doing brilliantly before the pandemic, but now the pandemic has made it even more difficult. That's the reality that we have to deal with and the reality that we, we must address. Now, if I may just mention about the population issue, one of the problems we have had is that we haven't even been meeting the demand for family planning. You know, more people have been interested in family planning than we have been able to provide. And now with the pandemic, this demand will probably become 
and then that demand will probably become bigger. And uh, you have people with, they want to plan their families, but they can't. So the challenges are, are not small, but uh, how do we lift them? That's the point, not that we give up, but how do we organize? We have to organize afresh. I think we need a lot of uh, innovative thinking for a way forward. I think I had the question, I would say, well, if we look at improving health, because you can't have sick children in school, sick teachers, sick farm workers, and so on. If we improve health, SDG 1, 2, and 3, maybe that's a starting point. We are building it on SDG 13, where we are doing this sort of thing well, 13 and 12. So maybe we could, we could move forward, but we have to find a way forward. And the challenge is, who is going to find that way forward? Thank you so much. And just looking at the time, we are, we are coming up on our hour and a half. Um, this discussion has been really rich, really nuanced, um, sharing perspectives from different parts of the continent um, and, and also different areas of work from nonprofit policy advising to um, the, the private sector and Professor Ware's rich and varied experience as an educator and also as an advocate. It's been um, a real privilege to, to have this discussion with the three of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the work that you're all doing. Um, I'm, I'm going to apl applaud by myself, but I'm sure that the participants are also applauding from their homes and offices and wherever they're joining us from around the world. Um, thank you so much. And um, uh, we, are, we have recorded this session, so we'll also make it available on the SDG Index website. So as a reminder, that's sdgindex.org. You can download not only the Africa report, but the summary available in English and in French. We have the short video that I showed at the beginning of this uh, webinar. Um, we'll have this recording available as well. And you can also explore our whole family of SDG index reports. We've done reports for Latin America, for Europe, for the Arab region. Um, and so if you're interested in seeing how other parts of the world are doing, and of course we have our global sustainable development report um, as well. So thank you to all the participants, to our wonderful panel, and take care of yourselves, wear your masks, wash your hands, um, and with the hopes that we'll be able to convene together very soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.